Hi guys and happy Friday. Today we're going to be taking it back to our roots yet again as we do on this channel to watch another Jubilee Middle Ground. Their newest one is on a subject matter that I'm going to be honest I'm not well acquainted with. Of course I have my opinions on it but it is capitalist versus communist. To me it's just kind of wild to even you know hear that there are people who are dedicated communists but we all know that this exists and that they're out there and they're preaching Mao and Marx so I'm actually curious to hear from them see what numbers they're going to cite in their defense of communism. But before we get into that, we've got Taylor in Nashville. Yeah, no better way than to, to enter the season of giving than listening to a bunch of communists uh, talk about taking all your money and redistributing <laughs> it to the masses. <laughs> it is indeed giving season, ladies and gentlemen. Now, without further ado, let's get into Jubilee Middle Ground. Would America be better under communism? You cannot Hannah, say Hannah, I don't the, the, I don't you do want to argue. You want to make your point, so let me make it back. Hannah, the, the, and then you're going to try to say it's too spicy for me. No, I got you. Like, it, let me respond to you. It is not capitalism coming in and enshrining enslavement. And in fact, capitalism is what got rid of it and started pushing back against the centuries-old awful institutions. So to say it's capitalism, I think it's honestly offensive. We are approaching the 150th episode of Minecraft, and we need your help to continue making more episodes. Join our Minecraft Patreon community and help us write. Oh, of course I am. Of course Always I am, guys. Up. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Power through. <laughs> the future of Minecraft. Persevere. Okay. Middle ground. Okay. I already recognize Cam Higby, baby. We used to work with Cam Ooh. at PragerU. You may have seen him on this show running the little boards behind the scenes. So shout out to Cam. I know he's about to throw down because Cam viciously defends capitalism on the internet. Uh, you can check out his TikTok where he, he just throws out the numbers, which is really interesting because I don't really focus all that much on uh, the economy or know all the different points that are going to be brought up in this episode so shout out to cam i know he's about to throw down america would be a more powerful country under communism may the agreeers step forward okay wow we've got a bunch of agreeers i'm obviously not going to agree on that just because i've never seen it work and i know a ton of people who have either been in communist countries and you know have have family that have fled those communist countries or have just witnessed this ideology taking place and they see how destructive it actually is on society so i can't imagine that america would be better off instituting communism <laughs> like i i can't imagine and i know people always throw out it's just like everybody being equally poor there's no real room for growth there's no real room for diversity or setting yourself apart uh competitiveness which i think is really foundational to the american economy is really taken out and, and pulled out from under you when it comes to a, a communist economy so those are reasons for which I would disagree, Taylor. Yeah, it's interesting they said the word strong, like America would be stronger if we were communists. I mean, yeah. depending on how what you mean by that, if you mean like military strength and ability to move quickly, decisively and unilaterally, then yeah, being a, a, in a command economy and having a, a you know, structure where there's a central authority at the power of every, or at the top of everything yeah you can exert power or wield strength more quickly but the question for me is does that last like we saw with the soviet union um it had the the veneer of power and strength and projected that to the world for as long as it did and then underneath it it crumbled and uh, you know people point to china as an example of they're strong mm -hmm. economically but i know there's there's cracks beneath the surface there as well and overall i don't think that uh that you might have some short-term gains and being able to, you know, wield your strength, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually stronger. Yeah, right. How are the how are the people of China doing right now? Let us know. No. I think it would be a lot better for all the people who are working jobs that are not, I guess, tech, basically. So I make content, which means that I work a lot of hours and I don't pay, pay the same amount as a soft dev. So I think it would create more creativity in certain like creative industries, artists. If you make a bigger pie, everyone gets a bigger slice. Yeah. Right. yeah. I see, okay, help me to understand this because I don't understand this. From my understanding, if you were to implement a, a communist style economy, 
you're not going to have a bunch more people who are suddenly allowed to be content creators. In fact, I feel like it would do the exact opposite. Content creation comes out of like sheer demand for for entertainment. You have to prove yourself on a competitive landscape in order to be a content creator. I don't think a communist economy is going to be funding more people who are like trying to do art or trying to be like e-girls on the internet. I think it would be more on like what's a necessity for society and how can we make sure that we're meeting production in those fields rather than how can we produce more content? Yeah, I mean, you you always hear this with the utopian thinkers is that, well, if we just had everyone's economic needs met, then uh, they would be free to focus on art, artistry and doing poetry and building things for society and being creative with all our human potential. And it's we, we, we haven't seen that ever borne out. Uh, right. First of all, when you don't have a proper incentive structure to uh, create human flourishing or at least uh, wealth flourishing uh, because you have a system such as capitalism that isn't a perfect thing, but it is in alignment with human nature and therefore does uh, create wealth, then you are going to have to redirect people's efforts and uh, efforts or uh, yeah, their productivity into certain directions and funnel that uh, toward things that make things work. And who gets to define uh, what the state needs or what society needs at any given time? It's the state. And it's the peop the small group of people that are in charge of whatever country adopts this communist model. And now you're funneling everyone's efforts into uh, projects X, Y, and Z. And, oh, look, the, the, your general um, economy is not going to flourish. People's needs aren't going to be met because now you're trying to, you know, force things in certain directions instead of letting demand, natural demand that arises, be met by people who are willing to voluntarily engage in business and all this stuff. So it's just going to go off the rails really quickly when you're trying to manipulate everything. And it's not a path to prosperity. It's a pro it's a path to absolute impoverishment of a population. Yeah, because I'm have to think, okay, so you need a certain amount of resources to function as a society or a community as the communists want to call it. Okay, so the government is responsible for meeting that production need so that you can live fruitfully, so they say in this uh, communist ideal. I've never seen that brought about in all of the examples of different countries that have implemented this. And it seems as though communist governments go on to exploit you beyond production of what your daily needs are, and then they utilize that for themselves. So you're going to be utilized for your labor in some way, shape, or form, and I highly doubt it's going to be like YouTube content creation or like talking to people on Twitch. That's so you get a Xi'an thoughts. factory in China where you're first forced to work for pennies for an hour and, uh, you know, real. don't start talking about labor rights or anything like that. I mean, this is this is the reality of the situation. Yeah. Don't get us started. Let's watch. I think one of the main misconceptions about communism is that it's just making everybody equally poor. When Marx and Engels wrote repeatedly that the first step under communism is increasing the productive forces in the U.S. I have a feeling they're always going to go back to what was written and not what actually happens. Over 80 percent of our population is living paycheck to paycheck. If you provide people's basic needs, if you invest in economic growth and in jobs and in infrastructure rather than investing in endless war and massacring Muslim people in Gaza, you're going to make this country a lot stronger. You're going to make the people a lot more stable here. But some of the largest massacres have been under communism. I grew up in, in a white ring area. Uh, I grew up in Denver, Colorado. I was born in Dallas, Texas. I'm the first American in my family. Everybody's from the Congo. If my family was able to come here, of course, they would have some capitalist connection. So I grew up very much with the idea that everything I need is under capitalism. Individualism, freedom, all these things are under capitalism. But I'm black in America. So those contradictions <laughs> really just create that friction where I'm like, this doesn't align with what I was told and what I'm actually seeing or actually feeling. What do you mean? What What about his experience of being black has held him away from any of the benefits of, of capitalism? I see him, he's fed, he's fully clothed. He even has his own like ethnic garb on. In the United States of America, what do you mean being black has, has hurt you in any way, shape or form? So why did I come to communism? When I actually read it, when I went from, from Marx to Lenin, to, to Mao, to Deng, to, to Fred Hampton, I started realizing, like, oh, this is patriotism. This is the idea that I look at another American and think to myself, I want you to be fed. I want you to feel fulfilled in your life. I want you to feel like you actually have control within your society. Honestly, as somebody, again, who grew up in that right-wing area, that flies over everybody's heads. Mm. <laughs> Disagreeers are walking quick on this one. <laughs> can, I say, can I say something first on this one to be- Not Ty Lopez. <laughs> Not do you want to live in a house like mine, Ty Lopez. <laughs> what? 
I did not realize that was him in this video. Wow. <laughs> I did not. Well, there is nobody more capitalist probably than than Ty Lopez, and he'll sell you a course on it. That's so funny. I don't know if he's like evolved since when I was, you know, originally introduced to Ty Lopez, but he has like a certain connotation for me of just like that guy who pops up in the ads before you watch an OG YouTube video who's like <laughs> trying to sell you a course and tell you to read like four books a day or something like that. Very interesting. I'm I'm very I'm very excited to hear from him actually. Great rep for capitalism. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, bold. Here's my argument. How come every communistic com country has to build a wall or a fence to keep people in? China ain't letting people out. My grandma. I mm. remember going. My Trump grandma. Built right one. Here. Trump built one. <laughs> they said Trump built one, uh, ignoring the obvious plot hole that the the wall was built to keep people from coming in, not to stop people from going out. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Uh, whoopsie daisy. Yeah, but where did you come? But, wasn't but where did you come? Out. There's not a mass immigration into Venezuela, into China, into Russia. Where do people want to go? Switzerland, America, Sweden. They're all talking about, we need to build a wall because people are coming. China's not going, well, we better build a wall because all those Americans are coming across. Right. Nobody's going there. So you legally <clears throat> cannot become Chinese. I w went to international school growing up, and every single non-Asian or anyone else that's like American or Canadian that's gone to China has never wanted to come back to the U.S. That's something that's really interesting. So I think it's like if you've never sure. been... That's an adverse selection, I, a group of people who well, are already... Finish your point, yeah. and then like, got you. I guess like whoever has the open mind to go visit usually doesn't want to come back. And I do live streaming, so I know a lot of live streamers who like permanently move over to the like Asia, especially China, because not just it's cheaper, it's also just higher benefits. Most people get like free health care. I can see you want to say something, Taylor. <laughs> oh, yeah. OK, well, my parents lived in China for mm -hmm. over two years uh, in Beijing and I visited them and, you know, they they lived there as missionaries and were like fostering community among expats and and doing had a, were happy with their life there, but they had to make a lot of lifestyle changes and sacrifices that they did not enjoy that much and were perfectly happy to come back to the U.S. And they were they were only there because of the overarching purpose that they were there. So it's I, I don't think that uh, her point holds. And also, you know, I'm reminded of like that. What was it like an Olympian ice skater or something from China that like spoke out against some of the the bad things that China was doing and then she disappeared and then yeah. came back and was brainwashed and saying, you know, singing the praises of everything in China. I wonder if this girl is still connected and she's living out of there or still is connected in some way that she's not allowed to say anything and is there kind of just as a, a brand ambassador for China so they don't kill her family or something. Oh, I mean, yeah, like look at look at the restrictions on the Internet in China, restrictions on free speech in China. You can't even look up a picture of Winnie the Pooh because Xi Jinping gets made fun of with that comparison so often. There's like so many things that are going on in there. My boyfriend also lived in China. I know several other people who have uh, taken it upon themselves to spend time in China and just, of course, it's anecdotal, but they don't want to go back. That is they do not enjoy having having lived there. So for every person that she says, you know, loved China and wanted to stay, I think there's a ton of others who just visited and didn't want to ever go back. Yeah. And just to add a little more color, I mean, just in my visit, if I wanted to access any social media back in the U.S., uh, I had to use a VPN to, to be able to access it. So the regular access to, to websites like Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Um, was completely blocked. And in my parents' apartment building that they lived in, there was a person on every floor of their apartment building that was responsible to monitor what was going on, like people coming and going um, or whatever. And then there was a person in their building that was responsible to get reports from everybody that's responsible for each floor of the building. And then that person had to go to the higher authorities and report what was going on in the building to uh, what, whoever was responsible for that area. And like the whole country is just nonstop mass surveillance all the time. And the, if you're in China and like happy with that or don't, or, you know, don't care to look up a picture of Winnie the Pooh or whatever, like mm -hmm. you, it's only because you don't know that that the something else is out there. And right. if, if you're willing to sing the praises, either because you're uh, not aware of the alternative or because you're uh, afraid that you do know and you're afraid that somebody's going to come bursting through your door and take you off to a gulag. Yep. So just to add a little bit of context. <laughs> Um, so it's a lot easier for you to survive there. I think it's not because people don't want to go. It's also because you're taught propaganda since a young age. China's scary, China's bad, evil, red Irony, dragon. Man. So people yeah. don't go and don't even go see it. 
That's the problem. I would Yikes. definitely argue that a lot of China's success is due to the introduction of free markets, but if we want to run with this idea that China is a socialist country, which is just fundamentally untrue, I could also just point to the fact that they're super low on the HDI. Their GDP per capita is like $12,000. The US GDP per capita is $70,000. Um, so, like, I, I would say, in terms of like economic success, we're definitely doing way better. Wow, Ty. Um, mm. In terms of how twelve we see to everybody. eighty thousand. So Camp said seventy, and they corrected and said actually it's eighty, <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> That's, That's crazy when the fact check actually strengthens your point. Yeah, yeah, but they're gonna say, oh, money doesn't matter anyways. It's a flawed Grayson system. Into this country, of course, we're American. We're only going to see the American viewpoints of this. China has immigration. People do try to cross the China's border all the time. We're all humans. Everybody's doing North the same Korea. thing the world. Would... Right. I'm like, <laughs> who? <laughs> who and where? Who's trying? Say what you're seeing is a perspective issue. I would love to break it down even more and talk to you about the massive amounts of CIA missions that have gone through Latin America to destabilize those countries, but just at that point. To what you were saying, judging a country by how much the wealthiest people in their country profit in their company, we both know what GDP means. I, it's it's a bad so faith way to a, really explain what about country. HDI? Human, Break down human, human development, uh, uh, sorry, human development index. And how so that it's mean? measured by things like health, income. It's the UN standard for like. Human development index is a summary measure of average achievement in key dimensions of human development, a long and healthy life, being uh, knowledgeable and having a decent standard of living. The United how Nations. How well an economy is doing. Uh, so from that point, perfect. Healthcare, we rank 37 in the United States. Cuba okay. ranks yeah. two sure. one. Oh God! Sure. Yeah. You, and you, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Hold Cuba on. ranks what? Cuba, Cuba it's ranks fascinating. what? Wait, I, wanna, yeah. I really want to engage. They've been number one and number two in the hover through those spots. According to Cuba, Cuba uses no, their according doctors. To the according, to the UN. UN. according to the Commonwealth Fund. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Been, Cuba, Cuba is eighty three on the HDI. They use their doctors like slaves because ninety percent of the profit goes to the state. They literally <laughs> traffic so, their doctors. When George W. Bush opened up a program to let Cuban doctors escape because they were trafficking them and making them go do these PR campaigns in other countries give health care, 7,000 people immediately came to the U.S. At one meeting, two doctors passed notes to other doctors. They were our friend Sabrina would be pissed. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we, our friend Sabrina has a, a Cuban family, uh, many of whom fled from what was happening in that country. So like to hear people be like, this is just like the bastion of freedom and health and, you know, prosperity is just crazy to me. And we've watched uh, on this show uh, footage of Cuban protests. And when they take to the streets, they are waving American flags. They are saying we want to be more like America, not even Cuban flags. So it's like, oh mm -hmm. my god! In Hong Kong too. Yep, in Hong Kong too. So it's like if if these are through lines and like their their vision of freedom and prosperity and individualism, and you know competition is America. Like, what do you say about that? And of course, there's always going to be people who say, well, it's better over there. It's better over there. We just don't like America. But I'm just like, what is your what is your grasp other than things that you may be googling? I guess. And it's such a privileged point of view, too, to be like, well, I was born in this country and I've reaped all the benefits of the civilization and, this, and the society that I lived in. But then I read all these books and now I know that it's really this oppressive force of evil in the world and that all these other countries right. that, yeah, they committed some genocides and had to slaughter millions of people in order to establish their regimes and they starved millions of people in order to... Uh, save face whenever their systems weren't working. Uh, but, you know, they actually knew the real way to organize a society and they really know what's going on. It's like, listen to the people who are actually fleeing these countries like Yanmi Park, like Sabrina's family from mm -hmm. Cuba. There's no shortage of examples of people who flee this communist uh, dystopia in order to act, have freedom and the to have the freedom and then look at the dystopia, look past all of the things that uh, are obviously wrong about it. Like he even mentioned uh, how, oh, the, the U.S. or the Western world is slaughtering uh, Muslims in Gaza. If you want to talk about slaughtering Muslims, what, what do you think is happening to the Uyghur people in, in China? China? Like, mm -hmm. let's have a, a little bit of honesty here, uh, but it's just completely lost on them. All of the things that they enjoy and that should be perfectly obvious. But no, I read a book. I got involved in this theory of how uh, economy should work and and it's like you've been indoctrinated into this like dogmatic religion and can't think outside that box is how it seems to me but maybe i'm just uh, a crazy capitalist yeah i want to say like i want to see if they oops get to places where this is working and like give examples of what they think are like some policy prescriptions that could work that could give me a little bit more yeah. like of a vision as to what they're what they're looking for we'll see 
They were on a hospital set with and said, kidnapped. This so is, this I is propaganda. The so I appreciate the emotional examples. 100%. It's not emotional. You can talk to the No Border Sovereignty Organization that Hannah, works to get health care professionals you out like of the there. You the nicest person in this room. I would, I would well, hope you let I'm me trying finish to get my this point, point across then, too. Then I'll answer. I got please, you. go. Well, I've been told that Fear, 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 fear is happening in Cuba. They're doing this super, super, super scary thing with Cuba, which is great. I would love facts. So I'm giving you in, facts in terms about of the doctors H fleeing the country and also about how they're having a ration, basic antibiotics in their Hannah, hospitals. Yeah, we've got them under an embargo, they, not, obviously. That, no, wait, medical wait, things are excluded since 1992. That's not true. Wait, wait, that's been that disproven true. by multiple Eddie, studies. Back? This it year during it. COVID, Cuba made their own COVID vaccine because the, the um, U.S. pharmaceutical company used intellectual property laws to prevent them from making this using our vaccine recipe. So they created their own, but they couldn't get syringes into the country because of the embargo. Because how are you supposed to get metal when you're on a they tiny island country and you're surrounded by the U.S. military? Eddie, I and you can't get any questions. trade in I want to ask you a few questions. Eddie. How, how question. far back do you I think the embargo is <laughs> affecting Cuba? How long back do I think the yeah. embargo like probably what, like since did... it's been put on? Oh, really? But so I think in, when we so look wait, at... No, no, no. Let me respond real quick, real quick. In 1960... The USSR became the largest trading partner with Cuba. They started paying buying more for Cuba's, Cuba's sugar. Yeah. They, they started buying all of Cuba's and sugars and paying right. more than the United States was paying. Fidel Castro is on record saying that the embargo had no effect on Cuba at all. So we can presume that up until 1991, when the USSR collapsed, that it didn't have an effect. So to claim that the embargo is affecting effect Cuba. On and, I, way, effect on and I think when we look at the, this is the, can I make a point? Because this is a point I wanted yeah, to make for a long time. When, I, when we look at countries like Cuba and China, I think it's more important to judge them based on what they had before the revolution. Before Cuba sure. had a revolution, nobody had access to health care. They were working Wait. on slave plantations Wait, that Cuba. were dominated by Western multinational corporations. China before the revolution, yes, there were famines during the era of Mao, there were far more famines before Mao came to power and before China was able to industrialize and get That's to the point today point. where they're now one of the most powerful countries on earth. In the 1950s, the U.S. was already industrialized. China had to do that. They were a semi-feudal country in extreme poverty. And in just 70 plus years, they've become this economic superpower. That is through central economic planning and, yes, allowing some of those private markets in. That's um, by undercutting the U.S. on labor because they don't actually have to pay people very much. They don't have to pay them based on their value. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, okay, yeah, it's a booming economy. And mind you, I, I'm not too well versed on the Cuban embargo, so I can't even give you any details on that. I don't know if you if you know some stuff, drop that in the chat down below. Uh, but all of that is true. You can you can like make these claims about okay, it was doing much worse before uh, you know the revolutions and before we start instating communist values and beliefs in the country, but also. But what are the state of like the human lives that are living there now? It doesn't seem like they are flourishing. So you can have all these bells and whistles that say our economy is booming. We're a superpower. Look at all of the different products in the United States that are that are made in China, which is quite sizable and would point to the fact that, yes, they have a very booming economy. But like who's making the, who's making the cup that you drink out of that says made in China on the bottom? Who's made your iPhone? It's people who are stuck in factories that they build nets around because they're jumping out of the windows. So I'm like, how do you balance these ideas and say that they're better off because they're an economic superpower now? I don't know. I don't, please let me know because it doesn't seem to match up. Like, yes, they're a superpower, but the people are suffering and suffering greatly, suffering uh, to the extent that they're not even allowed to speak about it out loud because there's no platform for them whatsoever. And they're enemies of the state as soon as they do. Value so they can make people come over there and work far cheaper, have their companies there, and then we buy their products cheaper. We are propping up China's economy, and we've been really stupid with our own policies when it comes to that. And also, we are constantly hamstringing ourselves because our government keeps regulating our economy more, getting more involved, tying its hands, so that they are outpacing us, plus all the money we're spending on war, instead of actually like letting people keep their taxes and invest in more things. So they are playing us right now. The U.S. has been really foolish, but it's not because communism works. They were starving up well, until 1929. Well, let's look at exactly what they did. Let's look at them. exactly what they did when they opened up trade. They opened up special economic zones where multinational corporations could come in, <laughs> but they said you're only allowed to do things as long as it's in line with the party and as long as it's in line with the government's central plans. I mean, to say that China's just capitalist, full stop, or that all their I'm successes come capitalist. from capitalism I'm saying is, that they were is pretty starving ridiculous. Before capitalism started they getting were starving the under door. feudalism. The Hannah and Cam coming here with the gun. It's so interesting because I don't know if you, if you track back any major corporation in the United States up to like 
like the the Black Rocks and the Vanguards who are you know funding all of this stuff and buying up all the businesses. They're giving all their labor and manufacturing to China. So China is working hand in hand with the very capitalist corporations that you hate here in the United States. And the reason they are going over there is, as she said, they can pay such low prices for labor and production over in China because of the slave labor that they're using, because they don't value the actual lives of Chinese citizens. So how do you keep those two thoughts in your brain at the same time without some sort of cognitive dissonance because the only reason these megacorps in the United States exist to the extent that they do is because of the outsourcing of labor and manufacturing into China. Yeah, and the irony of having an ideology that claims to be all about the working man, the little guy, the poor, uh, and then at the, what it actually does to the poor is oppresses the crap out of them and gives them a GDP uh, per capita of $12,000 versus $80,000 in the U.S. And you're mm -hmm. on the side that gives the little guy the $12,000 instead of the $80,000. Like, make it make sense. It, it, it's this ideology that says the end of the utopia that we are striving for justifies the means of depriving people of rights, ignoring the idea of rights. I asked somebody when I was in China, there was a professor from Canada who had lived there for decades and had a Chinese uh, wife and uh, family there. And I was like, what do Chinese people think about the idea of, of rights? And he just told me like, that is a, that is a foreign concept to them. Mm -hmm. And you, when you, you, when you're living in a country where you just have, you're, you're just told what your lot in life is from day one, you can't imagine anything different, but to, to look at this system and then to say from the outside that yes, because I care so much about the lot of poor people, I want to support this system when it is depriving poor people of their natural rights and keeping them impoverished and uh, allowing a government to completely trample on them, imprison them if they step a toe out of line, setting up a surveillance state. It's just the, the number of hoops you need to jump through, the uh, level of mental gymnastics that you have to perform, you you, you get a, a gold medal in the woke Olympics. It's crazy. Yeah, dude. And we haven't even, they haven't even touched on like the social credit system, which is, you know, the companies and the people are adherent to and that affects their lives directly based on how well they behave. That's a whole nother issue to get into. The, the spying and surveillance, as you spoke about, happens within every single major corporation within China, which is why we brought TikTok CEO here to the United States for his hearing to see if American data was also being mined by the Chinese government, as any company that operates within China has to give them access to all of their servers, all the information of every anybody who's using their website so that the government can spy on its own people and even American citizens. We haven't even gotten to that yet. We'll see. They got the fire. They know they're ready for this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Who is we? When you say we, who's in this we? Because we did this, because we did that. Who is this, who is this so again, metaphorical we? Because right? the U.S. government is not a capitalist government, and we have to be strict about terms here, capitalism is a system and an economy. The government can either uphold capitalism or they can impede it. Our government is constantly impeding it. So when the government comes in and tells you, you can trade with this person, you can't trade with that person, that is the government, which is we, because we have a representative government doing that. Is that something I, as a capitalist, want to see them do? An American citizen. No, we are I don't. American citizens, but we are American citizens, saying. and so they are supposed to be representing our interest. If we're going to talk about what we're doing as a country, yes, like that is a huge part of it. And I also want to go back to communism because when you talk about some of these countries that people often call democratic socialist countries, they rank higher on the economic freedom index than we do. That means Sorry. they are more capitalist yeah. in their economy than we are. And I don't think those countries are, are socialist, to be And clear. so I just want to make sure we're defining terms because communism is the centralized control and ownership of production I'm, I'm, of I'm companies, sorry. but this is Maybe. my point I'm trying to make. Like I we have to I, talk about actual systems that are communist if we're going the to debate this. To define socialism to me, it just it, it feels as very demeaning. Wait, are we like doing communism? communism or socialism? How do you define yeah, them? Because yeah, I'm hearing things called socialism Labor. that aren't. But the prompt is communism. I guess, like in terms of communism and capitalism, both are ideal states that don't fully work by themselves. But I do think capitalism is more pessimistic versus communism more optimistic. In an ideal state, if everyone so? actually worked hard and they wanted to contribute to a society to make it better, I think communism would work. Yeah. Everybody cares. I think you guys don't. are well intentioned. Well, you could, you could yeah, teach them though. Giving Thanks. people government aid makes them lazy. 
Giving people government aid makes them lazy. I guess it depends to what extent. I don't think that that is always true. Um, I think there are certain forms of aid that we could emphasize over others. I would love to see aid that focuses uh, around the creation of like healthy nuclear families uh, that other countries have. I believe Poland does that. Uh, where they they subsidize the the creation of families, they have like a grandmother allowance that I think for their for their elders to be involved with with family and things like that. I think that's beautiful and that's aid from the government. I'm not inherently anti welfare. I know there's a ton of problems with our our welfare system. I think it does incentivize bad behavior. And by bad behavior, I mean like creating broken homes. I mean not getting back on the job market. And there's a multitude of reasons why that could be. One, you're getting paid enough to do do nothing. Others say the welfare system is set in place to where when you do get a job and you do get yourself back on your feet, there's no sort of weaning off of the system and you're immediately cut off. There's a, there's a, a conversation to be had surrounding that. I don't think all welfare inher inherently makes individuals lazy, but I do think there's a sweet spot. <laughs> and I, I can't define exactly what that sweet spot is, but we need to create some sort of uh, welfare system that actually incentivizes the behaviors that we want to see because you know ironically when we put in this uh, massive welfare state at the hands of Lyndon B Johnson nuclear families like went down like crazy and especially within the black community you'll hear Larry Elder talk about it and detail it a lot in his videos which I'll recommend to you but if we're seeing these outcomes and they seem to be attached attached or in correlation with giving aid from the government, then we need to figure out the right way to do it. Because the government is there to support its people, and, and welfare is one of those ways, but we have to do it in a healthy way. Yeah, it's ultimately all about incentives and mm -hmm. what you incentivize people will will do. And I don't I don't think that government aid necessarily makes people lazy. Uh, right. I think human nature is such that if you give people free stuff, um, they will take it. Mm -hmm. And so or in position themselves to take it. And if you have uh, path A is, you know, fend for yourself and, you know, go out there and figure it out. And path B is, you know, don't do too much and the government will give you things. Well, mo most people will uh, tend toward doing the uh, <laughs> not getting qualified for uh, or not losing their qualification to receive government aid. So I, I think it's just a matter of of incentives. And I do think that, you know, you can't build a successful society or culture or country on the idea that the government should take care of everybody. Uh, it requires people who are willing to take risks in order to uh, create value that uh, other people can share in and that grows the overall pie. You know, you can't just treat the government like an, an unlimited ATM machine or an unlimited credit card where you just keep making transactions and, and pulling money out of the account uh, in order to to serve people because it's nice to serve people. Something has to be going into that. And if there's, there's trade-offs involved and in some ways it can even be pro-human and pro uh, taking care of poor people. It, to support the idea of capitalism, because now we're not trying to slice up the pie chart into ever smaller pie, uh, pieces of pie. We're trying to grow the entire pie so that there's more available for everybody. And of course, we I'm sure we're going to get into like corruption and the top having way too much and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And nobody supports crony capitalism. Nobody supports uh you know, the, the abuse of, you know, be special interests of corporations being in bed with the government and all that. That's not right. what I'm talking about here, but just on a very fundamental level, when you're talking about incentive structures and what's best uh, to organize a society, it's one that's congruent with human nature and one that understands that if people are incentivized not to be productive, then they're not going to be productive. But if people are incentivized to be productive, then they will be, and that will foster prosperity. One hundo. Let's see who walks. Getting government aid makes you lazy. A great example of that is Elon Musk. The amount of government aid the X Foundation gets in order to pursue inventions that don't work. How often did you hear about that tunnel? 
Elon Musk is just one example of many different right. CEOs, multi corporations. Makes no sense. Oh, okay. Throughout the course of you know human innovation and creating things that end up benefiting the world, you have to have tons and tons and tons of failures. And the reason that the government maybe subsidizes some of the projects that he's working on is because of the benefit that he has brought about to human society. And yes, that is benefit to the environment for like all the environmentalist communists out there with the electric car and things that he's done in in that arena. So it's not like without proof that he's simply given money to to work on this projects. And to be fair, I don't even know the extent to which the government subsidizes what he does. Yeah. And I mean, you, to your point, the, you have to fail in order to create something new and innovate. And that's, yep. you know, Thomas Edison. I didn't, what was that? I didn't, I didn't fail at making a light bulb. I discovered, successfully discovered 99 or hundreds of ways not to right. uh, make a light bulb, you know, or right. whatever the, the actual quote is. Um, but I think he's referring to with the tunnel thing, that's Elon's boring company. And I don't know the details of all that, but I can only imagine that the reason that that venture failed was because of the overregulation of the government in the areas like Los Angeles that he was trying to build tunnels in, and not because of his incompetence or the inability of his engineers or people like that to actually create a solution that would would be economically viable right. and aid people. And he talks about the difficulties of regulation when it comes to scaling um, his Tesla companies and with the FAA with regard to the, the SpaceX company. Mm -hmm. And look, I, I don't deny that that Elon has probably got a lot of uh, friendly contracts from the government. I know that with like the, the EV incentive, the tax credit you get if you purchase an EV at the beginning, that was almost exclusively for Teslas that people were using those for. Um, and you know, is it the the the, the principled, you know, uh, I don't know what you call it, conservative who doesn't want the government to be in bed with corporations uh, in me doesn't necessarily like that. But at the same time, you can't fault the guy for being innovative and trying to make something work that no one else was willing to do. And, and you could say that him doing that broke the uh, the uniformity that the automobile industry had about not wanting to move in the direction of electric vehicles because they would be behind in that that technology or they wanted to keep us on oil and all these other things and all you know the deck was stacked against them so all i'm saying is it's always more nuanced than i mean it's such a such a lazy argument and like right. a drive-by lazy shot at just saying like oh well that that one company failed and so you know elon gets gets support from the government or whatever it's like dude give me a break yeah wait till he finds out how many government projects funnel millions and millions and millions of dollars into them and then they fail you know one after the other after the other it's just and at least at least society like modern society people are buying those cars and they're benefiting from them like there's so right. many other things that are detrimental to society like right. you know getting a big farmer or things like that that receive subsidies that are actually crippling people and making their lives terrible and let's talk I'll, I'll stand shoulder to shoulder with you but like why are you coming after elon he's actually being productive right to get government aid to be able to do these things just because they have the net worth yeah, so I, I agree with you on this. I hate corporate welfare. I think it's the biggest perversion of capitalism out there. It doesn't work. Its track record is terrible. And it actually is the government coming in and picking winners and losers. And it very rarely goes in favor of small businesses, which is what most business in the U.S. actually is. That's a good point. I Bye. wish it, yep. yeah, if you're going to do that, small business would be the, the way to way do it. But the way it makes people lazy is not necessarily because they're bad people. It's because you have uh, fiscal cliffs. You get this amount of welfare if you make under $24,000 a year. You make $25,000 a year your benefits drop off. So it actually disincentivizes people from moving up, working harder, taking on more jobs. And it's a terrible structure. I completely agree with that from a perspective of, it creates animosity. If there was um, a system saying that you couldn't use a certain government aid program that you're already paying taxes to just because you make this amount, wouldn't you have animosity for those mm -hmm. people below you? The cliffs are, are, I think, more so specifically referencing like situations where people are taking in welfare and it compensates for their like lack of income mm -hmm. and then they get a promotion or something and they lose the welfare and they're worse off than they were before they lost the welfare and prior to the promotion. You build that state dependency and it de-incentivizes people to like work up the corporate ladder in their companies because they're receiving aid from the government. I think also we have to say what makes people work hard, not just what makes people lazy. Because I think that's the problem you look at government welfare, is it is essentially keeping people trapped. It keeps them trapped in cycles of poverty. We actually saw before the great welfare deal under LBJ was pushed through, we had a larger rate of people coming out of poverty and moving up in this country. And then when we implemented these programs, that has stagnated ever since. And we can see that that hasn't worked. Help me, sorry, just help me out here real quick. So when you say it doesn't work, uh, what didn't work? 
we have not seen a decrease in the rate of people who are in poverty. And part of this is based on the education system, part of this is based on different... Because of LG, LBJ. Yes, these programs that came in, the welfare, I don't know this because of it, I think it stagnated work that was being done. For me, as somebody who works in public policy, that's what I'm interested in. What works? And then uh, there's more about that in uh, Tom Sowell's book, uh, Race and Disparities, or what is it? Discrimination disparities, and Disparities. disparities and, yeah, Discrimination and Disparities, uh, where he talks about uh, LBJ, the welfare state, how that affected not only just wealth in general, but but black wealth and economic growth. There's also the fact that like welfare at the time was coupled with this like no man in the house rule, where the government would actually come to your house, knock on the door, and be like, do you have an able-bodied man living here? And if you had an able-bodied man living in your house, you were off welfare. So what does that incentivize? Being a single mom who doesn't have an able-bodied man in the house and just, you know, popping out kids, because the more kids you have, the more welfare that you you get. I'm not saying that people are like consciously making the decision of, oh, like the government's going to give me another check if I have another kid and that there's no man in the house. It's more, I think, of a, of a subconscious incentive structure that is pushed forward by the government itself. There are cases where I think people are incentivized to work less hard in order to keep their income under a certain level so they can collect a certain amount of you know, government money, which in that specific case, then then yes, I guess it does incentivize laziness. But also, if you look at government programs like Medicare and Medicaid, they're some of the most highly approved of programs in, in the country. And when you make a welfare program universal, when you make it so it applies to everybody, it basically becomes politically invincible because nobody is going to argue for their grandma's health care to be taken away. And we have a problem in this country where 45,000 people are dying every single year because they don't have access to basic health insurance. And I think if we were to nip that in the bud and nationalize those giant pharmaceutical companies and make sure that, that health care is provided to everyone, we would actually stimulate a lot of innovation, a lot of labor, and a lot of hard work in this country because people would be less bogged down by medical bills and would be more healthy in general. So without a market, if those are, if those, the pharmaceutical industry specifically is nationalized, how does the state set prices effectively? Um, Before you get into that point, did you want to say something? Yes, please. <laughs> there you go. I was going to add, I guess like I lived in China for eight years and 10 years in the U.S., so I have like the divide between the two. I guess in China, generally speaking, it's really safe. Um, and there's a lot more equality in certain areas. In terms of like, uh, support from the government, it is easier to get healthcare, 100%. And also, I think certain societies use communism well, and it can be used well to create, I guess, more equality. I think capitalism ultimately creates inequality. So one thing I was going to say, you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. There's an old saying, we went out of the fire into the frying pan. The question is, under what system do you it's not get the guys opposite. at the top becoming super Went out of the frying pan into the fire, yeah. Right. <laughs> into a worse situation. <laughs> Close enough. Yeah. Super wealthy because Stalin and Mao Zedong, Chavez these people become Chavez. Okay, Castro, this man is no angel. The question becomes, which one dampens our greed in a way that benefit the most think, people. Yeah, I don't even think it should be that. It should just be which system is more effective at distributing resources and helping people and have good outcomes. And China has abolished poverty and we have rampant Ch poverty. China hasn't abolished yes, poverty. Yes, they have according to the World Bank. There's 300,000 homeless but people, more people in China. Though, yeah. In ratio. He said they Google. abolished poverty. They did. There's Google 300, it. The World Bank wrote people. a full article on National they have Center abolished technology information. When China was pure communist. I don't think anybody's ever abolished poverty. I don't know. Has that ever happened? Can somebody no. <laughs> drop that in the chat? <laughs> Who has it's ever utopian, abolished it's a utopian poverty? Promise. Yeah. No, that's like a, that's just a crazy thing to say. Like some of these things I'm saying, I'm like, okay, I'm listening. Okay, yeah, we definitely do have problems with our our healthcare system. I wonder what the real like prescription would be for that and how we solve that. I'm open to hearing some perspectives or whatever. But then you hear like these very wild uh, assertions that make me think, okay, well. I don't know if I can listen to you on this <laughs> anymore. Well, it's like, uh, th that great Tom Sowell said, there are no solutions, only trade-offs, right? And yeah. when you talk to people of a communist persuasion, they tend to think in terms of absolute solutions. So we've abolished poverty. We've achieved equality. And you do that by making sure absolutely everybody everybody has equally amounts of nothing. Um, but the... People on the other side of the argument that are here are talking about, yeah, I mean, this doesn't work for everybody. This, you know, there, there, it does. Uh, capitalism may result in some level of inequality, but overall, it's got better outcomes compared to these utopian ideas that require you to punish people who, for achieving that 
it, it is not in alignment with human nature and, and under, it's not rooted in an understanding of incentive structures and how they works. And it has no room for the idea of trade-offs and no, no ideology, no system, quote unquote, uh, works perfectly. I wouldn't even call myself a capitalist in that I'm some believer in this capitalist system as right. a sort of religious way of thinking about how to build a society. I just think that capitalism more accurately describes a, uh, a way that humans interact economically and in a way that uh, achieves growth and more prosperity than the alternatives that would, and we should still root out corruption, etc. But to have such absolute uh, mentality about things is just betrays a level of simplicity in your thinking that I think is is lost on uh, yourself, but not to everyone else. Yeah, there is this sort of through line, it seems of like, oh, it just needs to be done correctly. And we you hear this a lot when it comes to like capitalism, socialism, we just haven't done it the right way. If you go back to the book or whatever. And I, I just don't, I'm open to arguments about like, uh, minor implementations that might do might do us better and, and might benefit society in some way, shape or form, but not for like this totality like uh, of, of government controlling all production of, of everything and parsing it out to people. I don't know. It just doesn't vibe with me. 45 million people starve to death eating bark and dirt and leaves. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to know, is it doing better? All the things you like, are you sure that's from the communist side? The Mao Zedong side, I would argue or is that from the capitalist side? I would argue it's definitely uh, the yeah. free market side. Yeah. I also just want to push back on one thing real fast. Are we still going to stick with the China thing? Because well, I just want there's to say so many point, great points yeah. here. We need that, a like, we need to, we need to focus. You know it's what just, I mean? It's crazy to me to hear somebody say China's safer, though, and like you can literally be disappeared from the streets. Like even your celebrities, famous tennis players, the famous FBI. people, they are. Shout out Julian Assange. Yeah, I mean, shout out Julian Assange, but we are not incarcerating Julian Assange right now. We are trying to extract him here for trial. <laughs> also, you can freely talk about Julian Assange on the internet and like share articles and, you know, talk about everything that happens. And of course, yeah, U.S. government agencies are no angels, right? And uh, there's several conspiracy theories or, you know, regular theories about uh, people that the government has decided to take out for, for any given reason. But one of the safeguards that you have in the United States from something like that is like you have a free flowing internet for the most part where you can platform yourself, you can bring stuff to to lie. People are free to speculate and talk about uh, their own theories as to what's happened. And there's there is a sense of accountability in that, although you may not always get it. If somebody goes missing in, in China, like that tennis player, it's it's lights out. There's not a peep about it. You're not allowed to talk about it. You post on the Internet to, uh, you know, uplift the story or to ask questions about where she is. And you're done for, too. Uh, the state will be knocking on your door the next day. So, uh, yeah, I just don't know about that. What? What are we doing? Our I'm been to, sitting in Belmarsh. And I've in spoken out with months. I actually work with his brother on the campaign to get him free. Yes. But what I'm saying is we don't have political prisoners in the US. Right. We don't. Who are they? Who are they? We Edward assassinate Snowden. them. Yeah, well, sure. yeah. Who? Yeah, 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 sure. Snowden. Yeah. Who have we assassinated? Um, Jaleel Montekin was, uh, was in jail for We did that? Years. The government did that? Panther. I'm fine with this. I detest the FBI. I detest most policing agencies. I've done a ton of work on criminal justice reform. That's fine. I, if I was a capitalist, I would court. love the FBI. No. I would love the uh, FBI. Why? Literally, literally, <laughs> no. literally the vanguard of capitalism, mm -hmm. 100%. Mm -hmm. How How I'm that? confused. It's one of the armed bodies of the state that protects the, the dictatorship of capital. Because ultimately, I mean, 90% plus of elections are decided by the candidate who raises the most money. Capital, the FBI is an armed body of the though. state. You recognize that, that, right? would yeah, yeah. that. Well, <laughs> you can say it's not you real say, capitalism, wait, wait. but capitalism no, has not, a tendency to it's accumulate. It's not capitalism at all. Capitalism is an economic system, you, you can, you can not say a government. Right, an economic system that concentrates wealth and power at the top, that incentivizes capitalists to accumulate capital, That's monopolize not. the markets, and this is simply the stage of capitalism that we exist in. When Iran tried to send oil tankers to Venezuela, the U.S. intercepted them with our military, took them back to Texas, and then gave that oil to U.S. corporations. How is that free trade? But How is that the free market? One and embargo are against... Yeah, again, I don't have to defend the U.S. government to defend I would actually argue the U.S. government is a huge to. enemy of no, capitalism. Don't. We don't. And I want to define my view economy. real fast, because I think it matters. This is more my like political view versus just my economic views. But I would say the only reason you need a government at all are for three things under capitalism, and that is to uphold contracts. You need a court system. 
You do have to have a policing system so that people cannot harm other people's property or their person, and you need a national defense system. Now, what the mm -hmm. U.S. has has gone so far beyond that. We should have a defense. It should only be a government entity. You shouldn't have private companies coming in and profiting off of it, and it should be on guard to protect us if there's an existential threat, not waging war against other countries, not getting involved in all this interventionism we've been doing since Vietnam, completely opposed to that. But to sit here and say that that's capitalism, that's the government actually attacking capitalism. Capitalism that's coming in and perverting our economic system. I like her. Okay, she's making me think about some things. This is stuff that I haven't, I, I've never taken the time to really sit and uh, think about. Mm -hmm. um, using our own tax dollars against us to do it. Communism has caused more suffering than capitalism has. Join a middle ground Patreon to okay. watch this exclusive oh, get this prompt. Yeah. Women are more empowered in a communist society. Mm -hmm. Women are more empowered in a communist society. I just mean, like, how much more empowered could you possibly be? Like, what else is there? What else do women need in our current society that they don't have here in the United States? Like, what rights, what privileges are you not able to exercise right now that communism would give you? I can't really think of of an answer to that. The only thing I could think of is where there may be disparities Maybe communism would equalize those disparities if it's right. like if it's in the name of equity. So everything would be sort of 50 50. If that was the goal, you can sort of radically impose that if you have the government working towards that end. But I don't view that as empowering whatsoever. So uh, for me, yeah, uh, it would not be more empowering in a communist society. Yeah, I mean, I agree. All I can think of is you're equally disenfranchised by the government as men and equally uh, deprived of rights as men because the government doesn't care whether you're man or woman. They're going to uh, do what they're going to do to you as a citizen to exploit you. So um, I, yeah, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Interesting. Curious to see what they say. There's a really good book on this called Why Women Have Better You want, you want Bunny to go first? No, 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 go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hilarious. I'm like, as a man, <laughs> I'd, I'll be quick. There's a really good book by Christian Godsey, who is a woman, called Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism and Other Arguments for Economic Independence, where she she's very critical of the USSR and the former Soviet countries, but she says when women have economic independence, that equals true freedom. Um, freedom to leave an abusive relationship, which under capitalism, a lot of women are forced to stay in those relationships because of financial dependence on their husband. Um, women are discriminated against in the free market system because they have babies. Women can get pregnant. So if you're a boss, who are you more likely to hire? A good worker who's a woman who might get pregnant for nine months and have to go on maternity leave? Or a man who's not going to get pregnant? It's just a, a natural biological advantage to men in, in the free market. So if you provide economic independence for women if you if you meet their mm. their needs that in turn equals freedom i read the same exact book it's <laughs> <laughs> a good one uh, the idea that only the man be able to get all the funds revenue for the family unit the idea that it's a woman's job not only to work as well but they also take care of the family at home i, I can't think of a better example nuclear family was literally forced onto americans like they had posts for it everywhere like <laughs> like how's that so let's say the U.S. Strong had wording. one billion people. How would you do to limit population? This is a prime example, right? How would they do it? I don't think they'll do it any differently than one child policy. Like, let's be realistic. If you gave the U.S. a million people, what are they going to do? They'd probably just let them starve. Oh, <laughs> but yeah, in but China, they're like, we got to ration we gotta goods and make sure we feed everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Circumstances were slightly different. They had to make choices. Might not have been the best choices, but if given the same circumstance in the U.S., maybe they would have done something similar. Comment I don't know what she's getting out of that. Food. Do you understand the point that she just made there? No. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I got the other two. Um, so my mom was really young during that time, but at least she saw what women were empowered to do. At the time, yes, they took all resources and pulled it together and divided it equally, but women were truly equal in the beginning of China and Cultural Revolution. Women had the same rights as men, they did the same jobs as men, because more labor the better, right? So everyone had the same roles, same jobs, um, and there was true equality until capitalism got, or social. Does that like sound fun to you guys though? Like everybody does the same jobs, the same amount of labor, the same uniform, and everybody is paid equally and you get the same thing because we just take all the resources and divvy it up. I can imagine that to some people, if implemented properly, maybe this is a utopian view for you that like everybody's the same constantly, nobody's going to stand out, nobody's going to get more than the other person and you know, everybody's taken care of. And that can be, you know, a view of the world that yes, if done, 
ideally everybody would have their needs met. To me, when I hear that, I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. If you could implement that ideally, it's wonderful that everybody has their needs met, but is there more to life than just like this servitude to everybody being equal and getting the same thing and being on the same plane all day long? For some people, that may sound fantastic and like, you know, feel free to try and implement that somewhere other than my country. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I do not, and maybe it's the American in me and like the the individualism that's breeded into my American blood or whatever, but that sounds like a hellscape of the government imposing what I should do, what I get paid for what I do, how much resources are allocated to me because I'm I'm one unit of a human being. It means it does, it does not sound like a colorful, wonderful world to be living in. No, it seems like it completely would suppress your your individuality and freedom of conscience to just be who you want to be and do uh, whatever you want to do. And the, the state really just looks at you as you're a unit of labor, male or female or whatever. You are a unit of labor and we need to assign you to outcome X, Y, Z. And that's it. And that's the extent. Now, I could see a communist maybe arguing that, well, once your needs are met, then you're free to be this artist and you know, pursue all your individual interests. And so your true individuality comes out, but only after your your needs are met. Right. But just where does that happen? Where has that happened in history? You know, are we talking about like Chaz? I remember the, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone in, <laughs> in was it Portland or Seattle or something dur during the, the BLM era. And I remember hearing a lot that they were establishing this communist utopia and they were planting all these gardens. And then they couldn't grow the food and the crime started bursting out. And uh, instead of everybody, you know, holding hands and singing Kumbaya and, and embracing their artistic expression, it was a bunch of uh, chaos and poverty and they needed aid sent in and police sent in in order to bring some order back into the situation. So I just, that's obviously like a microscopic example, but you know, uh, show me the example where, where that's happened, where this capitalism has actually, or uh, communism has met everybody's needs and then freed them to express their absolute individualism and artistry. I just, it, it's never happened because the condition A is never actually met because it, the system does not work. Yeah. And it's interesting that they started this prompt with like, yeah, I read that book too. Okay. You right. read the book. It's always I understand like where where has it been implemented and where has it worked? I'm very curious to hear it because they're making some endearing points of like, you know, uh, women have a baby in that nine months of their life. You know, there there it is. And, you know, how are they supposed to work during that time? How are they meant to be taken care of? Although women can work during pregnancy, maybe not the full extent of their pregnancy and some can't. But uh I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear, like, what what are your theories as to how you would, you know, take care of somebody who maybe has a, a abused in a domestic violence situation, but is pregnant, but can't work, but needs money or whatever? Like, how are you going to solve these issues? Because I'd, I'd venture to say that could be a problem that somebody faces in their life or it is a problem that people face in their life. But I'm just waiting to see, you know, where it's been done. And as always, I'm open to like, a mix of how do we get, you know, maybe proper welfare for people who are down and out in those situations, but not to completely overthrow our capitalist economy. Yeah. Right. And one more thought is mm -hmm. just, you know, what if a woman wants to be a mother and a housewife? Like, right. where's the room for that in your situation? And also, uh, in the U.S., if a woman wants to be a career woman and doesn't want to be a wife and a mother and doesn't want to be a stay-at-home mom or whatever, she doesn't have to. And she's free to pursue a career and do whatever yep. she wants. So uh, how is your system better than what we already have where a woman is free to choose either way? Yeah. And let's not ignore the reality that, yeah, if you are an employer, you would not be aiming for the woman who tells you she wants to have four kids and, you know, that's her goal in life. It's just a reality. I don't know why we can't just like accept reality. And yeah, anyways. Kevin's got introduced. Now in China, there's no equality. I truly think because more freedom, more trade. So in the beginning, when there was no corruption, it worked perfectly and everyone was equal. For the two seconds that there was no corruption in China when this system was implemented, <laughs> before they could figure out how they were going to corrupt the system, everything was perfect. I think we have a tendency too to boil down, to disregard economic freedoms when we talk about freedoms, especially in the US, we break it all down to individual freedoms. What do you have the right to do? But in China, the retirement age for women right now is less than 60. Whereas in the U.S., it's been actually going up because economic conditions for working people have been getting worse. I mean, that is freedom, being able to retire and spend more time with your kids, less time slaving away, making your boss rich. That is true freedom. 
I can agree there's conversations to be had around the retirement age. That's another thing. Women have equal rights in the United States. You are allowed to do the same things that men do. A lot of time what happens with um, like inequality is not the actually- The market, it, right? No, no, it's not the market. It's difference in preference. Um, yes. Specifically with like, if you're looking at like income inequality, there are so many confounding variables that you have to look at when comparing income inequality. Where do you live? What's the cost of living? Uh, what kind of job do you do? What's the risk associated with your job? Logically, markets and capitalism mm -hmm. is uh, the best resource. Right? You kind of prioritize the best, right? But if that's the case, women sure. could get pregnant, hence they have to take time off, hence they're But that inefficient. doesn't mean that they're not the best at something. Despite the fact that you can get pregnant, they can still be incredibly skilled over other people. But I think in capitalist societies, because of that time you need to take away, it's a risk. There are, there, sure, there are, disadvantages. It's like there are a biological disadvantages. Financial Nobody, risks. Is what yeah, Nobody, yeah. Nobody's yeah. contesting risk. that there's a major biological disadvantage for women. Women can also choose not to be Has there been a communistic country yeah. female <laughs> leader yet? Margaret Thatcher. New Zealand has one. Finland has one. Uh, is there a communist? Uh, Kim I'm, Yo Jong's her name, right? In, yeah. in the DPRK. Yeah. She's one of the highest up in the, in Wait, the DPRK. Wait, what, what country government. are you the using? The Democratic People's Republic <laughs> North, of Let's not use North would, Korea. Well, the U.S. has had also had like very high yeah, people. The actual but I'm name of the country is the DPRK. The point is, there's never been, if we're going to say communist, the prompt was through communist. Like how he said, in what country was that again? Economies, countries treat women better. So if you have no female leader ever, but you got to look at averages, though, right? No, but yeah. that's that's a bad average for you. Can I just, can I have my disagreement on the original point? Because listen, but we listen, disagree. I think it's a fair point in some ways, but also like as a woman, I don't want just to have like a tokenism kind of representation. It's a fair point if you're using leftist ideology. But you know, if you are uh, a capitalist, and I'm going to assume like right leaning in your in your viewpoint you would not view having more female leaders as being any sort of indicator to uh, equality of the sexes. So Right, like Ty's refuting the point according to their own logic and she's reframing the question under like a conservative logic. Right, right. If that doesn't, if Hillary Clinton became president, it would be no better for me as a woman, right? Yeah. So I don't, that no, doesn't actually advance me. But what does advance me are civil liberties. What do of advance course. me are having the ability to speak my mind, to pick which career I'm going to do, to decide if I want to have kids and if it's worth taking time away from the workforce or if I don't want to do that. The ability to have those freedoms are here. And yes, there are many flaws and there are things that, that take away from them in our society. But as you mentioned, legally, women have had equality for decades and decades and decades. And now that we have seen that time period play out, women have been advancing leaps and bounds. They are graduating college at higher rates here than men. They are starting to out earn men when you look at apples to apples, when they have the same job, same education. Mm -hmm. They're outpacing them in their advanced both in companies. Women and men need the same things. And that is freedom, autonomy, the government not getting in your way, equality, civil liberties. Do you think economic stability is one of those things that I women do, and, and men I think crave have, and need? But yeah. you would say capitalism is what gives Absolutely. economic stability. Or gives it Even better. though 80% of better. women are living paycheck to paycheck, it's still better. Wait, than but that's, 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 that's just relative fact, poverty. Yeah, so that's an issue. 80% of women are living paycheck to paycheck. Mm, I need to fact check on that. They didn't put one mm -hmm. at the bottom of the screen there. It seems gonna be relative. very, very see what poverty. Got here. Hi. Oh, yeah, let's see what. Actually, let me go back a couple seconds. And are living paycheck okay. to paycheck. It's still better. Wait, than but that's, 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 that's just relative fact, poverty. But so there's always going to be relative poverty, even if <laughs> everyone in society. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Do you know what relative poverty is? Bank. Everyone, there's always going to be relative poverty in every society because relative poverty is just generally defined as making 40% less than the median income. There's always going to be a median income unless everyone's making exactly the same. So there's always going to be somebody <laughs> living in relative poverty. But I want to address something you said earlier that we're like picking and choosing. Like the U.S. isn't capitalist here, but it is here. No, it's like <clears throat> you judge a country if it's capitalist or not based on how it expresses capitalist traits. So we can say that like in general, the U.S. is a mixed economy that's pretty economically free, right? But we can identify things in the government that we don't like and we can say, okay, well, those things aren't really expressions of capitalism and we don't agree with them. Um, mm -hmm. So let's just take three things. Let's take three things. Are women treated better? Do they thrive more under a communist country? I think it's not only symbolic, but it's also a reflection if you make a woman the leader. Only capitalistic countries have had women as the prime minister or the president, and there's lots of them right now. There's never been one in communist in history. America. Not even close. Okay, number two. Sorry. Yeah, well, America's not the only capitalistic country. Number, you have Finland, you have New Zealand, you had England, had Margaret, Margaret Thatcher. Keep going. Number two, I think it's a big deal that China massively disproportionately killed female babies. It's a big problem and even they admit it. So. When we say, here's the system that treats women better, come on now. 
the third the third one that I think is important is where do women want to live? How did that not even occur to me? I didn't even think about the one child policy and how freaking heinous that is. And I had a friend in high school who was literally a product of the whole one child uh, one child policy and was adopted for that very reason, just surrounded by other young Chinese girls who people had had given up just because of, you know, a law and just the cultural sense that women are less valuable right. than boys. That's where I think it's an interesting distinction maybe to make there is that the one child policy itself was kind of a tool of the government to tamp down on what was deemed to be a disadvantageous amount of population growth. Mm -hmm. um, but the selection for males within that, I think, is probably more cultural than right. it is like a, a product of uh, communism itself. Right, right. Well, definitely not here. Okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Well, where do they want? Do they want to live in North Korea? But North Korea is not a communism, though. It's a. Uh, which they one? they just said we're, 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 they just we're, corrected we're, me and said we're, we're it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really? They're, they're not really you guys a communist country. country. I think there's Juche is Marxism Leninism combined with but, Korean nationalism. That's their idea. Before we get too <laughs> far away for, to into North Korea, real quick, quick. Um, so they were down to use North Korea as an example when they were pointing to a female leader, but when it's used against them, not so much. Just from the standing on looking at the Constitution. Who could vote, who could participate within the government, within America, using America as an example, rich, white, owning The males. Constitution doesn't say that <laughs> at all. Democratically, within the nation, actually taking control, rich, white, land-owning males. That was within the Constitution. The, the, no, so, it's and not. I use, <laughs> it's not. Sorry. It used to be. It was, it was illegal let's for go, black people let's to Let's do yes. a legal, uh, legal mandate, women as well. And I use that okay. as an example to show women did not have rights within this system. At the, they fought for it. Okay. Th Aggressively with violence to make sure that they got their vote. What? Capitalism does not aggressively with violence, rights, especially <laughs> if you're a marginalized group, because it's just not profitable. Mm -hmm. So the country is other people. The country, the country, the country was not... established before, like before, like capitalist economic theory was established. But, but, and capitalists would just argue. You're the nicest. Have... You look like the nicest guy in the world. Please let me finish this. Okay, point. Okay, Please, can I keep saying that you're the you're the nicest woman in the world. You are so nice and so blah blah blah. Can you please let me finish? Mm -hmm. Were you gonna say something, Taylor? You put your hand. No. Uh, I'll let him finish. I'll let him finish. Okay. I don't know if he is. It looks like we're about to be out of this problem. Oh, please. Okay. God damn it, Cam. <laughs> God <laughs> damn it, Cam. You need a notepad. No, 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 no. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm bring my notepad. You need a notepad. Oh, you need the notepad. It, Cheating. Yes. Yep. I asked. Convenient. Okay. What were you going to say, Taylor? Um, now you're putting me on the spot. I can't remember. It was what did, when he what said the, the, the women took their rights violently, uh, aggressively, oh, yeah. well, violently. I was going to say that they, they argued not against what it said in the Constitution. They argued that they, as citizens of the United States, should be included uh, in the rights that the Constitution affords. So it was still, it doesn't undermine the uh, Constitution to say that women didn't have the right to vote uh, early on. It only, I mean, of course, they, they, they fought to add the Second Amendment, but the principles that the Constitution established and laid out were the ones that uh, they appealed to in their argument. So it's just, it's, it's a misguided kind of, again, like a, a lazy mischaracterization of, of uh, the essence of the argument, in my opinion. Should we skip a prompt here? Because we have a long way to go in this video. Let me see. How, how, how long have we been on for? An hour? Maybe we should go. We might skip. Let's see. What do we have here? Okay, we'll do this one. Only the rich benefit from capitalism, because this one's pretty important. And then we might skip to the last prompt. I know you guys are going to hate it. <laughs> We only got so much time here. Only the rich benefit from capitalism. Well, obviously it's not like, look at all of them here today to have this talk and like with all of the privileges and rights that they get to utilize. And I know I say this every time, but like, are you not a beneficiary of the current system that you're living under? Whether or not you agree with it or disagree with it, you are benefiting from capitalism. I hate this like, this uh, this argument that like nobody ever benefits from from it. There is no ethical consumption on, under capitalism or anything like that. When you know it's not true, because you're living, breathing proof that people benefit from the system. Of course, not only the rich are the beneficiaries. Uh, really, nobody. Um, Come on. Only the rich benefit from capitalism. Uh, capitalism being 
the control of a state apparatus or a nation, government, state, whatever word you use, by a certain class. So if rich people are, those, are that class and they control that state apparatus, the government, that nation, of course. That's they're. not the definition of capitalism, which I'm sure he's going to get checked on that immediately. The ones to benefit from it. Talk to the abyss. Looks like it, it seems like a TikTok. Do you guys disagree? Yeah, <laughs> you want me to explain why yeah. first before you go? Yeah, yeah, hit me, so hit I'm me. a Marxist, so I believe that society, through class struggles, transitions through different epochs or different modes of production, different economic systems. So I believe that the Civil War was a revolutionary war in America that transitioned us out of the slave-based mode of production in, in the antebellum South into capitalism. I believe that capitalism is a superior economic system to slavery. In Europe, I believe capitalism was, a, a, in many ways, a superior economic system to feudalism. But I would argue and, and agree that capitalism is better for everybody than, say, slavery. Like, you can still rise from the bottom with capitalism, and that's most societies. So it's like, it's possible for, you know, the less wealthy to climb to the top. If they have a good idea, or like, innovate on something that they think is a good uh, concept. We're talking about benefits, right? Uh, no, I, I see both your points. Um, definition, I oh, know, now I'm being empathetical. I was telling you not to give you a definition, now I'm about to give you a definition of capitalism. We should, we uh, should establish definitions of things we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, we gotta be on the same page about <laughs> <laughs> definitions. I, I, I feel like when it comes to science and ideology, it just gets kind of messy. It's just more, it's, I feel like it's just so much easier to do logical, like, well, I mean, if you, points, if you cite like, a definition, I'll accept whatever you give me. I don't know about these guys. My, nah, this is a trap, hold on, let me finish this. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> my idea of capitalism, um, I very much look at it within, again, very material, very cemented the idea of who has control over the military, judicial, legislative arm of a nation or a state. For, for an episode about capitalist communists, we have not talked about class. Whatever class has control within that nation. And now capitalism would be the rich, the bourgeoisie, the, 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 the job creators having complete control within that society. Of course, I'd only benefit. I'm curious how he feels about like the current boycotts that are happening for any given like company or corporation right now, which is essentially the lower class based on his definition, taking into their own hands the power that capital holds and influencing larger corporations based off of that. Like all these people who are currently saying like, I'm not gonna go buy a matcha latte at Starbucks anymore and are watching their, their stock drop or, or trying to get certain companies tunes to change based off of the money that they give them, how they feel about that not being a, a benefit of, of capitalism, or how they feel about his definition that one class holds all the power over everything, because then it would completely knock out the use or utility in boycotts, would it not? I would, I would imagine so. And uh, even as you're talking, I'm thinking he talked, he, he mentioned, you know, it's the class that has control over the legislative, judicial, military. I mean, the people who control the legislature, yes, there are politicians, but those are elected representatives. And so you ask the little guy, the, the, the person, theoretically, at least in the mm -hmm. system that we have, uh, does exert control over at least who's sitting in that seat. Now, we can talk about corruption in the system, but the system as it's designed to work is supposed to give voice to the little guy. So in theory, it's not this uh, class of people who are completely out of touch with uh, everyday people. It's the people that those everyday people elect to represent them. And of course, again, not saying that America's living up to that. We can talk all day about how much corruption and, and out of touchness is in, in Washington, D.C. But right. the, the, as compared to a communist system in which whatever group happens to foment the, re the revolution, seize power, uh, silence all its dissidents, throw them all in prison and establish a military dictatorship over the country, build a wall to keep everyone in from escaping, uh, control the airwaves of the, the messages and the communication and the speech that's allowed in the country. Um, which one sounds like there's a class that of, of special people that's ruling the entire system? Uh, it, to me, I'd much rather be in the one where at least I have a shot at representation versus one where there's inevitably a class of elites like the Kim Jong-il family in North Korea mm -hmm. or Putin in Russia or, I mean, we're not even talking to say nothing of Stalin in the USSR uh, or right. the Communist Party in China. Like those are classes of people that are uh, small groups of people ruling over everything in the economy and dictating terms to absolutely everybody else so how is that preferable to what you're outlining yeah just hasn't been done right taylor
the rich people. Of course you're gonna get, of course you're gonna push for tax cuts. Of course you're never gonna talk about livable wage, you'll talk about minimum wage, it's harm reduction. It's a tricky one. I'm not sure there's ever a time when wealth doesn't concentrate up, I- including Stalin, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot. It's all <laughs> Castro. Mm-hmm. You don't think Castro was a rich man? who was benefited from the Cuban system. Didn't he have almost a billion dollars when he died? (laughs) But I want to interject real fast, because unlike Cam, I won't just accept definitions. So when we talk about capitalism, that's fine, that's your definition. But for most people, when we say- She's going to separate it from the government again, I think. Well, she's been doing this whole whole episode, and nobody's adhering to it. Capitalism, what we mean is the free exchange and selling and buying of goods, right? And the more you have of that, the more freedom you have in those decisions, the less the government's involved in that, the more capitalism you have. And as we have seen capitalism expand across the world over the past 30, 40, 50 years, we have seen an 80% reduction in world poverty since 1990 alone. It was cut in half between 1990 Mm -hmm. and 2010. That's miraculous. It's fascinating. I didn't know that. We have also seen a 40% reduction in child labor. We have seen the mortality rate for children cut in half. We've seen the maternal mortality rate fall by like 43%. We work fewer hours. It blows my mind that somebody can say only the rich benefit from capitalism. What evidence do you have that that's capitalism incentivizing that, not China's poverty alleviation programs or the Belt and Road Because we're measuring as capitalism has moved into various countries, and we're looking at their poverty rates and their hunger rates, by the way, get cut. As more and more socialist and communist countries have fallen, which, by the way, we're down to only five at this point because most people are turning against it. As that has happened, mm. largely since 1993, we've seen more countries become democracies, more countries implement capitalism, and yes, sometimes- I love her, I wanna get her on the show. Yeah, she's, she she's would like, it. she'll school me on this, because I, I have so many questions. The implemented or the, the Belt and Road in their, uh, in their poverty alleviation programs, though. So what that's evidence do you have what? that that's not having an effect? That's when they did what? Launch their poverty alleviation programs in the Belt and Road Initiative, which are, in, are, are intended to build up um, industrialization in countries who have been, been prevented from advancing their productive forces. Oh, I'm so so curious to see how that all pans out. Let's let's check back in with China and the land that they're buying up in literally every single continent and see how that turns out for them. Go and check uh, in Africa, where yet another scramble for Africa is, is right now occurring, which I imagine our boy from the Congo here would very much disagree with, but all at the hands of China, where they're coming in and saying, you know, oh, we're going to build up these ports and these manufacturing centers and everything's going to be great and we're going to employ all these Africans. African people, and what do they do? They keep them at the same low positions and they allow Chinese people to take up the elite spots at the top of the hierarchy and essentially utilize the labor of these African people all in the name of development or we're going to the places where they're not allowed to develop on their own and China's gonna take that on ourselves. Look at all the land they're buying up in the US, buying up in Canada, buying up in Australia. You guys just give it a few decades and let's mm-hmm. see how that all pans out for us and uh, how it works out with the, with the stranglehold that we've allowed China China to place on our economy and on our land. Yeah, and real quick, the, these guys will, it seems like they'll cherry pick like specific stats within specific democratic countries or capitalist countries in order to make their point. But I love that she's bringing up like, if you just look at the big picture of humanity in general and under the proliferation of the free exchange of goods and services globally, uh, we've seen all of these trends when it comes to prosperity. We've seen the eradication of poverty, famine, not eradication, but of course, I'm not, not saying that there are solutions, only trade-offs, but mm-hmm. um, that we've seen the decline of things like famine and poverty globally. We've seen uh, a lot of wealth growth, global income, life expectancy, et cetera. Um, and as she's talking, I'm reminded of like Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now. He goes over all of these different advances that humanity has made under the Enlightenment uh, and under the, the introduction of the free exchange of goods and ser- services and a lot of these modern um, democratic ideals. The world has just become incredibly productive and safer and cleaner and better for humanity. And that in and itself is despite communism and not because of it. Yeah. And I'm just like, interesting because like in China excels economically. Okay. We've laid out some of why they've spoke to some of why, like in what other way do we view China as like the, the shining beacon on the hill that we in any way want to, you know, emulate the things that they're doing? Like 
what is China doing that we want to look anything like their country, but for some reason they feel the need or the want to adopt their economic policy. I mean, socially, China is uh, abysmal on some of the other, uh, you know, ideological points that these people might agree with on like sexuality and gender and race and all that stuff, abysmal <laughs> based on their own standards, yet they feel like they're like the the bastion of, of equality or equity, I should say, and, you know, uplifting the, the desires of their people economic sanctions and the U.S. dominated financial system that emerged after <clears throat> World War II where the IMF and the World Bank can basically decide whoever they want to give financing to. So like when Chile went socialist under Salvador Allende, um, <clears throat> Richard Nixon famously said, make the economy scream. And the IMF and World Bank went from giving them $200 million in funding a year to two. Why do communist countries always have to depend on capitalist countries to succeed? Anytime they don't, it's because there was an embargo <laughs> or they weren't giving them money. I don't hear us saying that about North Korea. The Congo Hello? is capitalist. Hello? The Congo is one of the poorest countries in the world. The Congo, though, is mineral rich. So much cobalt. Every single one of your folds needs cobalt to work. That is your real life vibranium. Capitalism. Vibranium? Did he just use a Wakanda reference? <laughs> I, he really did. He really used the Wakanda reference. And it's, it's poor because uh, outside <laughs> capitalists, or no, it's, it's poor because capitalism is a failure, not because people within the country are corrupt and that the right. system, it's like, it, it's not mutually exclusive. You have to account for whether there's corruption or not within the country and the system that you're talking about. It's not an indictment against capitalism writ large. And obviously, like, look at the labor practices in the Congo, which everybody and their brother is talking about now and all of a sudden, but you know, I'm like, I'm glad for it, whatever, talk, talk about it, bring it up. Look at the labor practices. And those very same labor practices are not happening here. Has not helped the Congo. The disorder within the country benefits the capitalists at home. And when that's you say the they're democracy. capitalists, what do you mean that the Congo is capitalist? Well, you better because watch your definition is not my African. You know who the new colonizers are? China. Don't Who's extracting it. resources it out of Africa? Mm -hmm. I love you. Terrible argument with me. That's great with, boy, great with the other type of guys. But just but because you say it's terrible but, doesn't mean it's To terrible. be clear, I, I'm point. not. I wouldn't accept your definition of capitalism, but I will obviously accept your definition of socialism. That's what I meant. Like obviously, I know what I think capitalism. Wait, what was so like, my definition like, of socialism? Just so I know, or, why, why is China? Whatever. Why do we think? Are you making the stance that <clears throat> supposed altruistic slash centrally governed China is not a new capitalistic empire moving into? Dubai, you see it there. Moving into Africa. China is not America. There are clear differences in what that. America does in the Congo versus what China does. America comes in, they set up military bases. Unmarked airplanes will come into the Congo with multitudes of American military and multiple corporations. You know what China does? They come in with intellectuals, with a document signing. Would you guys like to do this trade deal? If you do this, we'll build a mining facility that the state can run and that will benefit your taxes. And you know what the Congo will say? They'll say no. And you know what China will do? They make a new deal. You know what happens when you say no to America? <laughs> You and how does that find out about this? So very well, could say what he's saying could be true. I don't know about that. I <laughs> so again, and that has nothing to do with capitalism. Very, very long time. <laughs> okay, we're gonna skip to the final prompt, guys. This is getting, getting long. Okay, let's see. And here we go. The purpose of an economy should be to maximize the well-being well of the population. Of the population. Purpose of the economy should be to maximize the well-being of the population. I mean, yeah. I mean, it depends on what you mean by that. Maximize it's weird the well-being. It's I, I think. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, go for it. Wow, now I cut you off. Dang. Uh, <laughs> I was just saying, it's weird to me to even say like the purpose of the economy should be like to me, an economy exists whether you have an idea or a sign. A, a purpose right. to it or not you know it, it is the nature or it's the way that people exchange goods whether that's through coercion of the government in some way or have the means of production uh or it is the free exchange of goods and services and so that's just a reality people are going to try to get ahead and earn a living for themselves right. Uh, one way or another. So to to say it it needs to have a purpose, I think, is just I I, I guess I reject the question. You reject the, right the question. You don't like the frame. <laughs> yeah, that's what makes me think. Cause I'm like, okay, 
you break it down, okay, like to maximize the well-being of a population, what entity is responsible for that? Is there an entity responsible for that? Would you argue that, you know, well, the government is responsible for trying to maximize the well-being of the people? Or is that beyond what the government is supposed to be utilized for? And if it's beyond what the government's supposed to be utilized for, then we have to talk about things like rolling back taxes, because if we're giving them a certain amount of money, then you would expect something in return. And that something in return would be the maximization of the well-being of the population. But since you've made the point that the economy exists regardless doesn't necessarily drive a certain purpose. I don't know. Yeah. And I had one more thought on this is, you know, I've been reading a little bit on like enlightenment thinkers and stuff. And one of them uh, was Thomas Hobbes. And he had the, the idea of it really advocated the idea of having the consent of the governed. And also the big part of, of that and enlightenment thinking is like being able to reap the reward for your own labor. Mm -hmm. So when you're establishing a government, uh, which is really, I'm sorry, there's like a freaking bug in my, body <laughs> in my face. <laughs> uh, so I'm not just, not just waving my hands like crazy here, but if you're establishing a government system that is going to create the laws that you know, oversee, I guess, and dictate to some degree how business is conducted within a country. But from an enlightenment perspective, it's the government's job to make sure that you reap the rewards of your own labor, you know, that mm -hmm. you're able to pursue life, liberty, property or life, liberty in the pursuit of happiness, that you're free to do that and that you're not uh, restrained by the government or by someone else who's a bad actor in the society that you're sharing with them uh, from pursuing your own interests. And like Ayn Rand, similarly, like you should be acting in your own rational self-interest and the government should is only should protect your ability to do that. Otherwise, you have to say that it's the government's responsibility to take care of you. Right. And that's where we get into that broken instead of structure and that utopian thinking that, okay, where's the wealth going to come from now? Because now people aren't acting in their own rational self-interest. They're acting in the interest of the collective. They're not going to do that voluntarily, which is where consent of the governed comes back into the fray in order to get people to consent to a system that's going to work for them. Uh, it has to be a system that is going to let them reap the rewards of their own labor. So there's, it's kind of very philosophical, but yes. it, when you just Think about it. it. Of course, that 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 makes sense. And a, a communist system is not going to work uh, if it doesn't align with people's own self-interest. Yeah. And it's interesting because uh, so you that you bring that up. I went to a conference called TOSCON a couple of years ago, I want to say, and it was for objectivists. So people who like read all of Ayn Rand, uh, subscribe themselves to a similar philosophy as she does. And there was a guy there who did um, one of his talks. I think it was like an hour long. And he it believes in capitalism. His name is Eric Daniels. You guys can look him up because I'm not going to be able to cite exactly what he said. And I wish I could in this moment because it'd be very uh, apt for this conversation. But he defends capitalism and his whole talk was about how capitalism more so than compared to any other economic system allows for people to maximize the well-being of others in the population, but to do so from their own will to do that uh, and that it incentivizes that sort of work. Like once you can work for yourself and provide for yourself, you are more inclined to give to others who are not uh, at the same level as you are and where it may not be equitable, uh, we make more advancements under a capitalist system. And I just encourage you guys to li listen to him. I don't uh, know exactly everything that he was laying out or I would give it to you uh, right here. But yeah, his name is Eric Daniels. And there's this idea of, you know, what Ayn Rand talks about of like being somewhat self-centered in your ambition and your drive and in your work, but they sort of redefine selfish. A lot of us think selfish and we go like, me, 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 I'm only gonna do what's best for me. I don't care about other people. But there's an idea with selfishness that like what is within your best interest is other people being able to flourish, is other mm -hmm. people maximizing their well-being. And when others around you can maximize your well-being, that sort of, I don't wanna say energy, but that sort of environment flows through all people. And where you can't do that in, in communism, where everybody's just given everything and it's equitable, in capitalism, through competition and through being able to pursue your own self-interest, others benefit from that, if that makes sense. That makes totally. Sense. And I think you're you're hitting on something that I've kind of been thinking, too, yeah. is that just cold turkey, like straight up capitalism, where it's only about 
acting in your own interests or whatever, like that's not going to cut it. That's going to right. give way to the cronyism, the monopolistic practices, etc. And I don't think that even with all of the transparency and accountability and regulation in the world and trust busting in the world, you're not necessarily going to eradicate the greed that is inherent to capitalism because it is more uh, consistent with human nature. Therefore, like there's gasoline in the engine. It can drive, it can drive uh, productivity forward. Right. But just that productivity alone, there's no, it's, it's morally neutral. And you need also a moral paradigm uh, coupled with that engine that does work, but to make sure that the car, once it's moving, actually drives in a way that is ethical and sustainable and that like, works for everybody and that doesn't leave uh, people behind, et cetera. And uh, as we're talking, I think the big part of this conversation that's been left out is the sort of more moral side of things that the reason why I think that America has flourished and the West has flourished um, is not purely because of capitalism, but is because of the marriage of capitalism with a value system that's rooted in enlightenment, universal values, and even going deeper into that sort of the Judeo-Christian framework uh, that really gives rise to the success that we've seen in the world and has allowed everything to flourish because a moral people uh, are not going to let the greed get out of control in a culture that is full of people who encourage benevolence and encourage uh, taking care of the poor and not being overly greedy. Uh, whenever someone violates those rules, they're going to be shamed and culturally the, the gravity of culture is going to pull them back into a direction uh, that is more commensurate with a society that works uh, for everybody. And so I, could, I, could, I guess I could go on on that, but <laughs> I think that's a massive uh, point that is easily missed in this because I think people always criticize the excesses of capitalism and they're absolutely right. It, it is a, a rife with uh, moral hazard when it comes to the ability to indulge in greed and indulge in monopolistic practices and regulation alone, I don't think can truly restrain it. We should do our best. Uh, but you need a culture and a, a an ethic uh, that prevents against that, that, that curbs against it and demands something morally of people. And I feel like we live in a time where our culture isn't, is so against like asking anybody to just do something that they're not written on paper to do. And yeah. uh, that, that just doesn't work in, in a society. You need a culture that it has some degree of, Hey, here's the, the direction of how we need to behave morally. And uh, things work best whenever that you know, invisible sort of moral element is at play along with the structure of something like capitalism. Yeah, people always talk about capitalism through the lens of excessive greed, never through the lens of excessive philanthropy or charity, uh, which mm -hmm. which happens uh, in in this system. I think more so than than any other. My problem. <laughs> <laughs> no disagree. What happens if no one disagrees? I knew we'd agree on There's this. No debate. Interesting. Okay, so when all the capitalists we were... walk forward. So I'm so interested to see what they what they think after you bring up that point of like, I don't know that there serves a purpose. I knew we were gonna be mm -hmm. debating capitalists. I figured none of you would defend monopoly capitalism. You'd be more pro small business, more pro free enterprise. And you know, you look sure. at our current American system and it's not like ideal, you know, you're not giving it two thumbs up. So yeah, I just think we, we all agree that we're trying to find the best economic system to promote flourishing among society and the population. The economic system has the responsibility of taking care of their systems. That's common sense. Shouts out to Thomas Paine. I mean, yeah, yeah. Seems pretty <laughs> it's kind of self-explanatory at this point. Yeah. The government should always, or in general, the society should strive to be better and to make lives better for everyone. But I would say not the government. I mm -hmm. think you need smaller mm -hmm. government. That's the confusion. The three of them are always going government, 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 and then the other three are always going, okay, well, economy, free market, free market, free market. Uh, and that's a very large distinction to draw. And no matter how much the girl in the blue says that or Ty says it, it doesn't seem to ever land with the three communists that, 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 that you can have a world in which the government has no hand in any of that. To mess everything up. It's, it's still better, better know with you, Ty. Humans, if you talk about the flourishing, you can still see there's tribes that live more hunter gatherers. Small, I think smaller's better. What about a robot? What yeah, about but, an no, unbiased fam robot? Family's better. There's an anime <laughs> called Psychopaths. Yeah. Which, okay, you, okay you guys don't know? Okay, yeah. perfect. So I think a centralized brain computer with mm -hmm. multiple, like, millions and millions of minds in it might be more efficient. So a bigger government might be more efficient. If we could actually pull it off like psychopaths, I think it would work. But who programs the big computer? Well, at some point, mm -hmm. AI can think <laughs> yeah. for itself. 
But the I don't know. Even right now, even right now, with y'all right saw me test that AI girlfriend. Uh, we all know how that went on the ideological front. AI development, though, because the way it starts to gather its information is by absorbing what's already out there. The so they're already having so many issues with AI being sexist, being yes. racist, starting to have really toxic views. So I think that it's um, <laughs> it's a nice utopian dream, right? I get your point. But to me, I would never trust anybody or any piece of machinery to come in and run our people. lives. That's and our goal right? is to get worker ownership of the means, means of production and worker control of production. So I actually agree with what you're saying. And one of my buddies, Christopher Halali, is a, is a communist farmer in Virginia, and he lives in a very similar community to you. And you know, he says the same thing. Workers should be able to make these decisions about when to harvest, you know, but mm -hmm. they can't do that if all the farmland and all the, the farming tools and tractors are and fertilizers owned by multinational corporations and big agribusiness. I would like to note that you said control rather than own. And I think that under a capitalist system, workers do control the means of production by using their money as indicators, right? Like the business owners produce things based on the demand that consumers or workers are the same thing have. Our dollar doesn't mean fucking shit. Our sorry. dollar does mean something. It's an indicator for what things are valued at. But if a central decided, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, if the central decide, if the central the government the just decides right? what it's worth, no, like they have no sure. indicator. It's surplus is because price is just a signal of scarcity. It's what are they long term? Hey, there's like not as many things as this, so the price is going to go up. Or hey, we've got a surplus of this, so the price is going to come down. It's a signal to people, and it signals scarcity. If you remove that signal, that's why centralized economies fail because there's, there's no, no way of allocating resources. There's no economic calculation. Like, and, and then you have the situation where people have to go into the black market to get things that they need. It creates utter chaos versus just like look at like, Cuban grocery stores. Right. <laughs> Try to go get I'm eggs thinking. or like cake mix or something like something absolutely normal. Like how many people come to the United States and they come to a grocery store and they just like fall to their knees at the options that we have and everything that exists. Now you can view that as like excessive or overabundance or overconsumption, but it's something to be said uh, when you know. Uh, Would you rather abundance. have one option that's like cost you an arm and a leg? Right, right. When when abundance turns to scarcity, then you're going to have a very different view of of things. <laughs> Interesting. And also just on the point of like the government decides like what or like well, there's they're rejecting the idea of a dollar, like having a dollar as a unit of measurement or something right. or saying like that it doesn't. It's and not an indicator. I just my mind immediately goes to uh, like Venezuela and Argentina and what what happened with their like the government just says, OK, things are going to cost this much now. This is how much a dollar is. But the problem is in a global economic system, the rest of the world doesn't care what you and your utopian communist society is saying how much your currency is worth. It actually has a real value that others are willing to uh, participate in trade with you on that basis. of. Mm. And it turns out whenever you set a value that arbitrarily the rest of the world's going to define that for you and in their systems they they got out of control inflation because they i guess fundamentally understood uh the role of currency in an economic system so it sounds like these guys are kind of falling in that same trap yeah i think so under capitalism, you have this free flow of goods based on the signals that are going out between merchants and purchasers. That's it's all very point, uh, I would say that any capitalist would agree that the ability to just quit your job and suffer through the demeaning act of trying to find another one is not a great example I of agree. freedom within this country. Why? Yeah. What? I'm it's very, very easy to quit your job and get another job. Like, it's demeaning. not difficult. Why is it sure, demeaning? Sure. How is that the demeaning? average yeah. person who decides to quit a menial job, mm -hmm. who has no access to education to get them a higher paying job, who has, no, who, has, who has no social connection, no cultural connection, no state apparatus helping excuses, them. Excuses, real life, excuses, just pure excuses. Real life. Oh, it's man. not as easy as turn off, turn on. This leads to another really great example of government intervention that really screws up. You brought up education. Pretty much anyone in the United States can get into college, no matter how terrible so your grades were. That oh, that's yeah. great. That really that's leads me to my next true. point. It's cheaper in it's, It is very yeah. expensive, but do you know why people are able to go to college despite the fact that it's super expensive? Because the federal government comes in and says, hey, I've got two bags of money right here and um, I'm willing to give it all to you even though I know you can't pay it back. And then the colleges say, well, hey guys, you know, it seems when we keep raising our prices, the government just keeps yeah. paying it. Yep. And the kid, we don't even have to worry about if the kids are able to pay it back. We're just going to keep on paying it. The trend line for like college and tuition prices and like government involvement in the education system, especially on the collegiate level, is like identical. What does government do well? We forgot to ask prop that. Prop up prop. capital and prop up Kill big Congress. banks. Kill, but but then you don't like government. Congress. Then we all agree we don't like government. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious that they oh, wow. end on this note that the government is like so corrupt and then they're advocating that the government take care of 
everything. Right. So I make it as big as possible. I don't make, understand. Make it make sense. I don't understand. It's not making sense, guys. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> we got through it. Everybody's shaking hands at the end of the day. I actually learned a lot. Like I said, this is not a topic that I typically focus on on this channel. You never see us go into like economic conversations because I'm not no. particularly well versed in these things. I know I have my foundational like beliefs about capitalism versus communism, but it was nice to get into some of the nitty gritty points that one would argue on on either side of this. So I learned a lot. Need to get that girl on the show because she killed it. Cam killed yeah, it as great. always, but we know that Cam's got he's like a he's a fax machine. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And shout out to Ty Lopez for putting himself out there and participating in this a little bit. I think yeah. that's a, a bold move by him. And I, I liked his contributions. Yeah, he did well. He, he killed it as well. Guys. And the communists, I guess the word for them too. Shout yeah. out to you guys for representing your views. We always celebrate free speech. Yes. Thanks for showing <laughs> up and, and choosing to have a conversation and maybe not finding middle ground, but at least having the discussion in the first place. But guys, I want to hear from you. Drop your thoughts in the comments down below. Uh, did you learn anything in this episode? Did you know everything in this episode? Do you want to add any facts that were not stated throughout the episode, drop them down below. As always, I encourage healthy debate, so duke it out, but do so respectfully. And we're not going to have super chats today. I apologize to everybody. Uh, since we're on the old holiday break, there will be no super chats on today's show. But thank you to everybody who has chosen to support the show. We appreciate every single one of you, and we hope you have a fantastic weekend. Bye, guys.